I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. Glad to be here and glad to have you along as well. Today is uh, Friday, August 4th, 2023. A beautiful day here in Minnesota. I hope it's beautiful wherever you are around the country and around the world. Thank you for being here. First of all, thank you for being a part of this conversation. We do this five days a week. Our objective, our goal is to create a place where we can talk, share our, our ideas, our analyses, our, our interests, uh, our fears even, and certainly our solutions, uh, and to operate uh, in the sense and the spirit of uh, the responsibility of being the co-creators of futures in which we win. Well, before I get going, I want to invite you, uh, listeners and viewers, no matter where you're connecting, to support the growth of this engagement of this uh, platform. And as I often mention, we stream across seven different platforms, uh, two in YouTube and three in Facebook. We stream live to Twitter. We stream live to uh, LinkedIn as well. But we're trying to direct traffic to the YouTube Insight News channel. That's where we want to grow our subscribership. We want you to subscribe. Uh, go to YouTube Insight News. Click subscribe. Click like. Click share. Uh, tell some friends that you know, we're doing this every day and Friday, every Friday, the Healing Circle. Great people, great conversations, important conversations, and we want to grow our base. We're looking to get a thousand subscribers. We're about halfway there now, and your uh, clicking on and signing up today puts us puts us one click closer to that uh, thousand uh, subscriber objective. We want to also <clears throat> uh, begin by uh, reminding you that we join our friends over at the Minneapolis Health Department. Uh, inviting us all to be, you know, COVID aware. The pandemic is over formally, right, officially, but uh, there's still a need to pay attention uh, and to uh, follow the protocols. So we partner with the Minnesota Department of Health to remind our community that risk still exists. Let's continue to follow the COVID-19 protocols, means meaning wash your hands, stay aware, prioritize prevention, uh, and the spirit is that together we can create more awareness. We can encourage testing and help everyone stay healthy. So listen, enjoy this show. Remember, uh, be well, get well, stay healthy. And uh, thank you again for being here. Got a great program today, uh, a great topic. The topic is shattering silence, the effect of depression on black men's health. And today we're going to be joined uh, by our uh, uh, partner every week on the Healing Circle, Dr. Oliver Williams, and uh, two other stellar uh, leaders in the profession, in the field, in the community, Dr. Harvey Linder, and also, oops, uh, also the um, uh, uh, Ricardo Solomon, who's one of the leaders in Hennepin County, uh, corrections, I believe, and, and beyond, an authority on uh, mental health and our health as a community. So it's going to be a good program. Let me first welcome Dr. Oliver Williams. And Dr. Oliver, how you doing? Hello, how you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. As always, Dr. B won't be with us today, but it's cool that you and I are here. And, you know, I, I so love the beginning of this program because she always sets us, uh, sets our intentions with describing the protocol of the uh, talking stick. So I'm going to ask if you would take on that responsibility today and let our viewers and listeners know how we do the healing circle. Okay. Thanks, Brother L. Uh, you know, one of the things that Bravada is sort of uh, uh, included in our discussion and how we operate with the, uh, 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 the healing circle is that we do it in circular fashion, uh, meaning... Uh, what we do is we share a, a talking stick and that different uh, members of the, the show can uh, ask for the talking stick or we can pass it to someone and uh, they can uh, uh, take the occasion to be able to talk about something that they think is uh, significant and important. So what we do is we end up sharing the talking stick because it operates uh, in an egalitarian way between participants, whether it's male or female, whether it's old or young, 
But the other thing that we value with the talking stick and in our value, we value uh, each member, but we also value our ancestors. And we value our ancestors because they're also uh, closest to God. Uh, and so as we're having this conversation, we're going to uh, use that protocol. And with that, I'm going to um, introduce mm -hmm. Dr. Harvey Lender. Good afternoon. Go ahead, Harvey. Harvey Lender is a, a well-known psychologist in the Twin Cities. He's worked for Hennepin County. But say a little bit more about yourself, Harvey. Well, I like, um, thank you, Oliver. Uh, it's good to be uh, back on the show again. Uh, it's, this is a very important topic to, uh, to embrace. And uh, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about, about myself. I'm an ostensibly retired clinical psychologist. Uh, I tell people I'm retired, but I'm still out there, you know, uh, trying to help the community, trying to do what I can. Um, but I uh, worked for almost 30 years uh, for Hennepin County as a, as a clinical psychologist, senior clinical psychologist for a period of time as chief clinical psychologist for Hennepin County. Um, and I also uh, helped to found uh, a chapter of the uh, Minnesota Association of Black Psychologists here, which is a, a chapter of the National Association of Black Psychologists. And uh, uh, I've basically dedicated my career to uh, trying to help the black community deal overcome issues of uh, of uh, you know uh, mental health. Well, Harvey, among the things that I'm curious about, because we're talking about the issue of depression, so we know there's mild, moderate, and uh, extreme depression. And could you define it for us? And can you tell us tell us how you uh, make the uh, assessment about what's mild, what's moderate, and what's severe. Okay, uh, well, the depression, uh, the, the challenge for most people in understanding depression is, is that uh, depression is one of the most common ailments that, uh, that people suffer from. Uh, but there are different kinds of depression. Uh, depression is both an illness in itself uh, but it's also um, a common symptom of either other illnesses or it's also a common uh, symptom of things that are not illnesses but are actually social conditions. And because of all those things, uh, depression is often uh, either misdiagnosed, uh, wrongly diagnosed or underdiagnosed uh, or, over, or overdiagnosed. And so we have all of those kinds of factors that we have to, to deal with in helping people um, come to terms with uh, both recognizing and figuring out how to deal with the depression. So it's, it's, it's a challenging kind of ailment, but it's actually one of the most common ailments that, that we encounter in the mental health field. Hmm. Dr. Linder, is there a particular nuance that applies to uh, people of African descent, uh, I would say, uh, coming out of a history of captivity, right? Uh -huh. Dealing with the freedoms we have today. Are there particular nuances when you discuss the broad uh, field or concept of depression and types of depression that we may experience that make it, that are more unique, or is it all common, uh, universal, human? Well, it's not just a it's not just a particular nuance. It's it's actually a bevy of nuances mm -hmm. that affect African American and especially Mac African American men. You know, one is the uh, the assault on our uh, concept of self. Uh, you know, the, when we have our our concept of who we are and, and what we're capable of uh, being impacted by uh, what we deal with in racism in our society, uh, that in itself can lead to um, you know, ending up with a, a de depressed mood um, just because uh, uh, you you have this negative self concept that's visited on you by society, and so uh, you know, in addition to you know the fact that some people might actually you know contract an illness 
that leads to depression. So you have all these kind of factors that kind of pile up on one another. And so basically what we end up doing is just uh, trying to identify the fact of, is this person depressed or is this person not depressed? And later on get into trying to sort out the factors that contribute to why they are depressed. Some people may de be depressed just because of physiological things that are going on in their body. But with African-Americans, we're also depressed because of the, the sociological things that are going on, not just uh, attacking our bodies, but attacking our communities, attacking our, our families and attacking you know, um, just our self-worth. So we have all of those kinds of things to, to deal with. And sometimes it's not a matter of just, of just trying to sort out, okay, which one of these things is active? Because with African-Americans, usually it's more than one thing that's going mm -hmm. on at the same time. Right. Yeah, and, and with the, the issue of depression, uh, so with mild depression, we might, that's something that most people uh, experience and some people can sort of feel blue uh, every now and again. But so with severe depression, people feel hopeless and helpless. They and do. Some, and sometimes- Hopeless and, helpful, helpless and and in many cases, suicidal. That's what I was- Self-destructive. Exactly. And so that's something that we have to be concerned about as well. Right. Yeah, and that uh, sometimes it's medications that can be helpful in, in terms of people being able to adjust to it in terms of biochemical challenges. But uh, the other thing is doing talk therapy mm -hmm. to be able to work it through as well. So could say a little bit more about that uh, and the remedies to address it. Well, the good and bad news is that depression is actually uh, one of the most treatable mental ailments uh, that we have. We have a number of different medications that can treat uh, depression. The, the challenge with uh, treating depression with medication in the black community is that we, one, we have this um, uh, negative um, concept about being mentally ill. And so there's, you know, there's a reluctance one to admit that there's something treatable wrong with you. And so that, holds people back from accepting the treatment. And then if you get to the point of getting people to accept the treatment, there are two other things that go on. One is that um, antidepressant medications don't work like we're accustomed to, like we're accustomed, like if we have a headache, you take you know, an aspirin and you know, within 20 minutes or half an hour, the headache feels better. Or, you know, with, with most illnesses, we're used to like taking some medicine and then you feel better. With, uh, with an endogenous depression, you can take the medicine and you may have to take the medicine for four, six, eight weeks before there's any noticeable sign that you're getting better. And oftentimes what happens is that the person who's depressed isn't the one who notices that they're getting better. It's like the people around them will notice that they're functioning better before they begin to notice that they're, they're they're better. So there's this thing about, first we have this antipathy towards taking uh, psychotropic medication. And then there's, you know, that's layered on with the fact that there's no perceptible change when you start taking the medication. And so what tends to happen is people stop taking the medicine before it becomes um, optimally effective. And so they give up on it and they say, well, I took the medicine and it didn't work. You know, it's like, I took this medicine for like two, three, four weeks and it, I didn't get any better. So then they stopped taking the medicine. And so part of the challenge is, is helping people to understand um, how the medication will work and that it, it can help them, but it may take a long time before it actually helps them. Yeah. Dr. Then, Linder, I love you. The other challenge through. is, is once the medication starts helping them, mm -hmm. then they feel like, oh, okay, I'm cured, so I don't need to take the medication anymore. Right. And then they stop taking the medicine sure. you know, before they're actually well. 
So I'd love to have you walk us through, Dr. Linder, some of the specific medications uh, and why this is prescribed rather than that or that rather than this. What are some of the, the tools in the toolkit of medicines that you all have to help people uh, deal with and overcome uh, depression? That's number one. But the second part of my question uh, sort of reveals, uh, you know, part of the perception challenge that you're talking about. On the one hand, we are slow and, and hesitant to identify our feelings as being mentally ill or having an illness, right? The stigma of that. And so we resist both advice, seeking it or following it. On the other hand, we always talk about self-medication in mm -hmm. our community, and it's probably all communities, but in ours in particular, people who abuse alcohol and who abuse drugs uh, and find like other ways to try to get through their pain, or whatever it is, or to find. So how do we reconcile uh, the prevalence of self-medication, but the inability of us at the same time to, to seek guided direction in uh, trying to become healthy? Is that a good question or not? I don't know if it's a good question. Let me know. Let me know. <laughs> it's too good of a question. Uh, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to that, to that uh -huh. question. Um, th to start with the, the first question you asked, like, what are the medications mm -hmm. that uh, can be helpful? Uh, I'm not really even prepared to, to launch into trying to answer that for people because there's a whole slew of antidepressant medications out there. And usually what will happen is um, your doctor will try uh, try a, a medication or a medication within a class because there's three or four classes of antidepressant medications. Uh, the doctor, and a lot of it is trial and error. A lot of it is, is figuring out what medication works inside what body. Uh, and so the doctor may try something. And again, I, I, like I said, it can take you know four to six weeks for the medicine to begin, begin to have an impact. So they try something and then you know have the the person come back after six weeks and then they'll adjust it they'll they'll like maybe add to the dosage or take away from the dosage uh in order to find out what works right for them so that's that's one thing um the other thing about taking about you you mentioned about self-medication mm -hmm. is oftentimes we'll have people who are who are reluctant to take a psychotropic medication. Uh, so instead of taking the psychotropic medication, they're doing other things like they're drinking a lot of alcohol or they're smoking pot or they're, they're doing something to relieve the symptomatology. Uh, it, it makes them numb to the depression or whatever else they're suffering from, but it doesn't actually help them get better. It masks what's going on. And so, you know, that's another issue that we have to deal with is like, oftentimes when people are presenting to us uh, with uh, a biological depression, uh, they're not being presented to us as someone who has a biological depression. They're being presented to, to us to some, as someone who is in uh, a domestic violence situation or has, as, 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 as in a drug abuse situation. And so you have to like unlayer all that stuff to figure out that what is really going on with this person is the person has an undiagnosed depression that was not properly treated. And so they're doing all this other stuff. They're drinking alcohol and getting, uh, you know, beating up their, their spouse or partner uh, or, they're, or they're zoned out on, um, on pot or some more serious drug as a way of deadening all of that hurt that they're feeling. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a constant uh, challenge to try to unpack what's actually going on with the people that we see. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that I, I think too is that again, when you think of people feeling a sense of helplessness or hopelessness, uh, when you think of women who are uh, dealing with the issue of uh, depression, sometimes their depression is connected to being in a domestic violence circumstance. Mm -hmm. And alleviating that uh, 
circumstance, it still takes time for them to be able to get over it, even though that part may be relieved because they're in a safe place and they're away from somebody who's victimizing them. Them ha developing a, a sense of themselves, recognizing that the vi violence that they experience is not their fault. Mm -hmm. They uh, still need some time to be able to uh, recognize and heal from that. And that may take some time for them to sort of understand uh, those situations. And I, But you, among the conversations that uh, I, I want us to have, because we're talking about Black men and uh, depression, I want to, uh, in addition to having Dr. Linder, uh, bring on uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ricardo Solomon, who's an MSW, and he works with Hennepin County as well. Among the things that he uh, addresses is prisoner reentry. So, uh, Mr. Solomon, there you are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. I am uh, apologize for the connectivity issues earlier, but I'm here. I uh, have been listening to the conversation. A lot of good information, a lot of relevant information, and uh, that basically, you know, coincides with what we're seeing uh, in corrections. Right now, I'm... Um, I, my, my specific role in Hennepin County right now uh, concerns uh, working with um, young adults, um, 18 to 24 year olds who are connected uh, with the criminal justice system on the probation on probation. Uh, and so we see a lot of that. Uh, we're the, the individuals we work with are at the age of early onset of mental illness. So we see a lot of the things that um, mental illness, the more serious mental illness starting to manifest itself. However, you know, with regards specifically to depression, we know that uh, a lot of that just comes from the, the human condition, right? Our own condition, especially with black males in terms of, uh, you know, how they're seeing um, the, the level of community violence, the environmental factors that take place that uh, basically drive depressive behavior. And, and, and not to mention what we're seeing now are a lot of influence, influences, you know, social media influences and things of that nature that really like uh, drive their perception of themselves, you know, this negative, uh, you know, self-concept, you know, that they that they have based on, you know, that that's early on, you know, that's w whether they're um, starting off in elementary schools or preschools or whatever, that 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 whole instance of that negative self-image that's conjured up early on. So we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Well, let me raise some questions, uh, uh, Brother Solomon and Dr. Linder, Dr. Williams, just what I'm thinking about as a layperson, as you all discuss this, and to the question of negative self-image, how that develops in people, it shows up in depressive behavior later. And I'm just thinking that my wife and I used to walk every day down in the skyways in Minneapolis, our morning routine, five in the morning, walk about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, through the department stores, they had lanes for people doing exercise walking, right? Mm -hmm. One day we're walking uh, down off like First Avenue in downtown and we see a little white kid, um, looked like he's by himself. We're walking one way, he's walking the other way, just diddy bopping along, you know? Um, and then about a half a block later around the corner, we see the mom and another kid in a stroller. And so we both have the same thought without having to say it. Who is this kid? Why is this kid here by himself? And then, you know, say 30 seconds later, we see the mom around the corner and we look at ourselves and say, how can she uh, let that child uh, walk that freely in the skyways at five in the morning? Mm -hmm. And the thought came to me, that's her way of teaching that child that he owns the world, mm -hmm. that the world belongs to him. And he has a right to be wherever he wants to be as he is at that time. That's the instruction from my point of view. And I, I say it because I know that I would never let my child uh, out of my arm's reach in a situation like that. And so the question is, what does that mean in terms of our rearing, our cultural you know, sensibility, the context that we are in, uh, is there any any lesson to come from that about how we perceive both our place in the world and our ability to be perceived as and act as owners and masters of the world versus our conditioning 
to always be fearful and to watch out for what's around the corner because we, we have no control and maybe we have no power. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm winging it here, but what do you guys think about that? Well, one of the thoughts that I had, and you, you uh, Harvey and, and Ricardo, help me out with this. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the environment that you're in, I know when I was a kid and I was going to school, public school, um, one of the things that was interesting, it wasn't a question about if a fight was going to happen. It was, it was a, a question about when it was mm -hmm. going to happen and also whether or not I'd be involved in it or not. So the sense of safety or caution is the thing that I think about. And then there were sort of perspectives about how you were supposed to handle it. So as a, as a child, you think that you have to get engaged and, and uh, uh, figure out how to deal with the consequences of, oh. of that and that you needed to learn how to fight. Back, you know, many moons ago, the expectation was that you were supposed to engage. And, you know, if you didn't engage, then you were uh, seen as being weak. I have a friend named uh, J Dr. John Rich, and he's uh, 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 a guy that was is a physician. But he said he got tired of uh, mopping up blood in the emergency rooms. And he ended up uh, interviewing the people that were either the victims or the perpetrators. And um, he came up with an article called The Meaning of Being a Sucker. Mm. And so the, both the victims or the perpetrators uh, said that they didn't want to be perceived as being a sucker. So what they did is they got engaged in fighting. The yeah. same notion to me with a lot of gangs is that you try to get into a game where you feel like you got some support by other people it appears they're going to watch your back. You know, uh, the thing that I, I wonder is that when we uh, talk to young people about changing that circumstance, the question that I, I wonder is uh, when they go back to those environments, do the recommendations that we come up with make sense for them in that environment? Mm -hmm. And if not, then what does? And then what can we do to support them because oftentimes I think people want alternative ways to be able to respond. But I'm going to put that out there. That's my perspective. I want to pass the talking stick to Ricardo and Harvey and see what you have to say. Yeah, I, I, yeah, just you know, just understanding the you know the parameters of uh, you, you know you talk you know uh, Al you talked about you know the kid and 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 his parents being able to open the door for him to realize that you know that sense of ownership on his part. And it's since privilege that's carried on. Uh, I can't use what I'm seeing. We've seen this forever, I guess. You know, um, and especially now with some of our young people, is that you know the whole concept, you know, of 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 not being able to have a sense of ownership for yourself. And we're all all in this like fishbowl. We're all in this community together that's been traumatized, and 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 all of the things that 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 lead to us having, you know, to, to deal with the community that's based, you know, that's basically uh, been traumatized a little bit, the, 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 the extent of post-traumatic stress, right, spills over into our behaviors where we can, where we interact with each other. And it's like, we, we don't have a sense of power, but that's, you know, that's jostled upon uh, through physical, you know, through physical tension, you know, through uh, machismo, uh, through all this stuff that, that, that really doesn't do anything except for continue to lead to, you know, our sense of hopelessness and our, and our, and our, and our uh, reduced sense of self amongst our own peer groups, right? And so, you know, we know that uh, this, this racism uh, that, that's been, that's been uh, uh, existing in our communities, you know, uh, allows us to have this increased, you know, risk of developing a sense of psychosis, right? Uh, because of the hot, that that uh, chronic stress and trauma, you know that 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 stress of you know like you talked about Oliver, you know like you going to the playground knowing that you know it ain't about when it's going to be a fight, it's about I mean like if it's going to be a fight, it's about when it's going to be a fight and if you're going to be involved, right? So you know that that sense of that that sense of trauma, 
right? That chronic stress that we see in that, that racial trauma that, you know, that, that really isn't, you know, you can't say it's racial because uh, from, from, from a, a general standpoint, because it's embedded upon us all being a part of the community, but it is because we're, we're involved in this community that, that we act upon each other. You, know, you talk about uh, black on black crime and how that is. That's, that's the result of what we're talking about, Oliver. It's the result mm -hmm. of us having no one else to act, act out on but ourselves. Right. You know, it's the trauma, you know, anxiety, the high levels of stress, you know, all the microaggressions we see, what you, know, what you referred to, Al, was a microaggression, right? The, you know, that, that ra racial trauma, you know, it, it, it harms our, our sense of um, identity and that self-worth uh, that impacts a, a person's mental health. You know, so you see that and our young people see it all the time. You know, and, it's, and I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's basically uh, embedded at an early stage, you know, where, you know, they're in preschool and they act out and all of a sudden they're, they're restrained or they're put in, you know, in a situation where they're made to feel different. And it, it disrupts their edu ability to be able to be educated appropriately. And therefore those, you know, th those things that result from that carry on later on in their life. And we see it, you know, as, a, you know, as, as, young, as our young people tend to develop. I mean, I'm working in child protection, you know, you, you, you focus on the parents a lot of times and, and you feel sorry for the kids, right? And these are, end up being the same kids that you're afraid of, right? Our general public's afraid of them later on when they are involved in the criminal justice system. So, you know, all those things that are not tended to at early ages and stages, you know, they're, they're part of these, these things that tend to um, continue to permeate throughout our communities. Right. How have before, you before Dr. Linder answers, Doctor, let me give one comment from one of our viewers, uh, Mike V, who's a regular here, says uh, uh, the lack of anger management tends or leads to shorter lifespans and generational loss of black men leaving a power vacuum of future advancement for our people. So respond to that as you generally respond to the, the, prep, the question, if you would, Dr. Linder. Well, I think that uh, it's a delicate dance to uh, teach our, ch our children, both that uh, they uh, have every right to, uh, to uh, enjoy the world the way everybody else does it, that they have every right to do that, but it may, may, it may not be the smartest thing for them to do that in every circumstance. I mean, it is possible for us to uh, teach our children that uh, as African people, we are the progenitors of the human race. Uh, and that, you know, as the progenitors of the human race, we are equal in stature to every, anyone out there. Uh, but it's also important to teach them that given the conditions that we currently live under, that it would be foolhardy in some situations to just act as if you own the world when you're coming up against other people with guns who think that they own the world. Uh, but we can and, and have you know, learned how to uh, teach both, to teach people that uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's not a good idea to, uh, to act as if uh, a policeman won't kill you uh, when we know that that's a, a possibility. Uh, but also to understand that we, as people who understand the, 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 the commonality of the human race, that we have a responsibility uh, to understand the situation that we live in and to understand our responsibility as a race of people to be the ones who take the leadership in working on trying to change the situation that we live in. Yeah. And I, I think that's it real important, uh, you know, uh, Harvey, the, the idea that, um, you know, in some ways we respond to the situation like everyone else, but in some ways our reality is different. Mm -hmm. And how do you respond to it given the different reality and that there's some people who there's a guy who ended up doing a, a project about uh, looking at violence and basically saying it's the same thing for everybody, rather than looking at the context of different people. Mm -hmm. And I think what you described, Harvey, encourages us to be able to look at the diversity that exists in the reality that it exists within different groups. 
Yeah, I think that's that's uh, uh, important. I also think it's important to be able to consider that in the context of ethnic differences too. You know, um, so there are ways that I would uh, talk about us addressing the issue of intimate partner violence mm -hmm. or uh, community violence in the United States differently than I would in, in different parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. so. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Ricardo to comment, to generalize if he's willing to, just about observation. Since you're dealing directly with people who are doing their reentry from prison or incarceration back to the community, are there generalizations you have come to uh, that that sort of give us insight on this question of depression in our people, uh, our capacity to uh, either work through or find healing or to change or grow out of or to grow into something different. You know, just looking at the, the caseload you've had over the X number of uh, years, are there some general statements or maybe there are none, but what, what are your thoughts, uh, uh, Brother Solomon? Yeah, yeah. So when I did work as a, as a parole officer, I mean, I, right now I'm a supervisor, I supervise probation officers, but, you know, the, the concepts are the same in, in, in a sense, you know, uh, but they change dramatically after a person has, has left, has been involved in the institution and is leaving the institution and coming back into the community. What you're seeing is a person who has, you know, basically been broken down and, 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 and stripped into a structural, um, you know, structural process which is what incarceration is, you know, it's basically meant to like uh, a sense of dehumanization in a sense, you know, and no matter how many programs you have within an institution, um, people still have to come back out. They have to come back out into, to environments that they left, um, uh, communities that they trans transgressed in. And so, you know, what we, what, what uh, we find is important is to be able to give a person a sense of themselves back, you know, a sense of dignity, and I think the important thing to do when someone comes back in the community is allow them to believe and understand that they still have, you know, um, the ability to become something, you know, greater than what they've experienced before, you know. Um, and that, that comes within a sense of being embraced by the community, uh, being able to like feel as though your sense of self-worth can be restored. And I think that comes through a lot of different means. Um, most importantly, uh, a sense of acceptance, you know, um, once you feel, you feel as though you're accepted, you know, because it's going to be tough. People coming out, getting rejected for jobs and getting rejected uh, for places to live and, and not feeling a part of something. You know, Oliver uh, mentioned before about um, some of the uh, dynamics with regard to people involved in gangs or groups, you know, uh, but I, and I think a lot of that uh, is entailed when someone comes back out into a community where, you know, they, they're in institutions, you know, people have to be, feel as though they have to be a part of something, you know, or else you won't survive there, you know, but, you know, but the, but the big thing is to become uh, a person who has a sense of individualization. And, and that sense of individualization allows you to be able to believe and understand that you have the capacity to take control of your own life, you know, uh, based upon the fact that you're out and not in a situation that you've been in for a number of years with someone else tended to have control of your life and your own mind. So the psychological impact comes in. So that's why as communities, we have to embrace each other. Uh, we have to be able to have things in place for people who come out of institutions or people who are on probation where, you know, the, the whole concept of that sense of incarceration, whether it's in the community or whether it's in an institution, is meant to strip you, you know, of your self-worth and be able to uh, be seen as a sense of punishment in a sense. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to make sure that um, with people who are coming out, that they uh, are able to uh, understand the skills that they do have, the things that they can do to become, you know, whole people. And and I think it, uh, that that part of healing starts within ourselves. And and you know, we would typically just go to like a church or something like that, but it's, it's, it's much more than that. You know, it's, it, 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 it basically uh, lends itself to all of us in the community being able to embrace people who come back out mm -hmm. and offer them a sense of dignity and pride that they can take and, and believe that they can be part of something and other than having to go back in and, and, and feel as though they have to respond in a way that's uh, led by violence or, 
you know, uh, or just regulation. So I think those are those are important things that we try to impart upon those we work with and, and uh, what I try and teach my my staff, the people I supervise. Yes, yeah. Dr. Dr. Linder, go ahead. And unfortunately, our correction system uh, is not correctional. It's not rehabilitative. It's designed to uh, contain people and to punish people. Uh, and um, a lot of a lot of a lot of people don't recognize realize that somewhere upwards uh, of seventy percent of the people in our jails and prisons are people who are suffering from some sort of of mental disorder, uh, uh, depression being one of those, but all, all other kinds of mental disorders as well. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, while they're incarcerated, uh, it's it's difficult, if not impossible, for them to get any treatment for their uh, for their disorder, uh, particularly psychotropic treatments, because there's an antipathy towards giving people medication, uh, psychotropic medication when they're in prison or in jail. Uh, some of our correctional institutions have begun to recognize that. And in fact, two of the largest mental health treatment facilities in the country are the Cook County Jail in Chicago and Rikers Island in uh, New York City, uh, where they have began to recognize that, you know, we have all these people who are suffering from mental illness um, we need to be treating them. And so at Cook County and at Rikers Island, they have, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists and a mental health staff uh, who can interact with these people uh, and help them to begin to get some treatment while they're in prison. But as, uh, as uh, Ricardo was pointing out, uh, when people come out of a prison, um, they meet all kinds of challenges in terms of of you know being it reintegrated into society, we build barriers to people being able to reintegrate in society because it's hard for them to get a job, it's hard for them to get an apartment, you know, because they have this you know red mark on their on their history that says they're a felon, and so it's it is hard to be to be reintegrated into society and to resume a healthy. Uh, 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 a healthy lifestyle. Are there other models for treating depression that uh, come out of uh, the what you described the nature of our culture as progenitors of humanity? Are there some systems and processes or approaches to uh, healing, uh, to prevention, to reconciliation, even to punishment and retribution that uh, it could be in place? that would do things differently, uh, not so much as corrections or punishment, but as restoration and healing. Uh, I raised the question because I witnessed a, um, a meeting called the Apatakesi in Kumasi, Ghana, and it was a weekly uh, great sitting, they called it, of uh, the um, uh, elders and chiefs in the uh, Ashanti community there. And this particular day, there was an argument being, or a conflict between two families or two people. But the the, the town said in council, uh, and the two people that had the problem had to come to the center of uh, this uh, big meeting. Mm -hmm. And not only the victim and the alleged perpetrator, but the families of both. Mm -hmm. And their stories were argued and the people around the room provided analysis, interpretation, stories, you know, anecdotes. And at the end of the day, uh, as a group, the leaders, elders made a uh, judgment in favor of one or the other. But the judgment didn't affect only the perpetrator, but his or her whole family. So oh. the question is, are there models that should involve community in restoration and healing, as I think you're suggesting, uh, Brother Solomon and uh, Dr. Linder. What do you think, Dr. Linder? Indeed, there, indeed there are models uh, that come uh, actually from ancient African history, uh, but uh, the modern world will be uh, familiar with the concept of Ubuntu that was um, mm -hmm. the, the kind of philosophy underlying 
the restorative justice movement in South Africa, where, um, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, when things go wrong in the community, when people are not doing well in the community, we in Western culture have learned to uh, perceive it as uh, if someone's not doing well in the community, there's something wrong with that person. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, the, the, the broader African concept is that someone's not doing well in the community, there's something wrong with the community. The community has to make some sort of adjustment to restore the balance of what has gone wrong in the community. Um, this, is, this comes from a, 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 an ancient African concept called ma'at. And ma'at is the concept that um, the universe has a way of being right, you know, that things have a way of developing. There's a right way for things to be in the universe. And to uh, sustain that right way, uh, one has to maintain the balance, one has to maintain harmony, one has to uh, uh, maintain justice. Uh, and so when there's an injustice that happens in the community, uh, the objective is to somehow figure out how to restore things to a just form. And, and usually that's figuring out how to, how to restore the harmony in the community how to restore the balance. You know, when something goes wrong, the assumption is that it's because things have gotten out of balance. And how do we get things back into balance? How do we get them you know, back on course? And, uh, and so it's this concept of, 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 of making ma'at in society, of creating a society that's just and harmonious and balanced and where people act with propriety uh, and, and, and recognize the, 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 the well-being of members of society. And so it's, 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 it's that kind of thought process that leads us to you know, different models of restorative justice that you will find practice not just in South Africa, but you know, across the African continent that there's some version of of this, that the community has both a role and a responsibility in uh, restoring the rightness of the community when things are, are going wrong, rather than blaming isolated individuals when mm -hmm. things are not going right in the community. Excellent point. So, so let me ask uh, Ricardo and Dr. Williams, is that teachable here today? Is it being taught? Has it been taught? And uh, can it be taught? And uh, manifested in our daily lives as African people uh, in this country at this time going forward. Uh, what do you think, uh, Brother Solomon? Well, for me, you know, Dr. Linda hit on so many just just really, really pointed, you know, um, points there, you know, and he talked about uh, how things are in African communities. Uh, they have a sense of community. You know, we, we tend in this country, I believe, to operate on a functionalist a form of thinking where it's functional for people for something to be wrong with a certain group of people so they can be labeled. And um, when you talk about a sense of community, you know, we just, I have to look no further than out the door here in North Minneapolis and how this community has been depleted, you know, by certain things, you know, that, that really uh, didn't exist in this community. Well, it has existed for a, a while in some form or fashion, but, you know, right now it's run, it's been run rampant and it's not because of the people in the community. I tell you, uh, you know, you, you see how, um, you know, how the community has been divided in terms of uh, resources. You know, you can, you know, you can go out and see that, you know, you can get drugs quicker in this community. They can get a healthy meal. You know, there's no place around that supports that. You know, uh, you have a grocery store, Cub, you know, here that, you know, should be a, a pillar for people in the community to get healthy meals and things of that nature. So when those things are taken away uh, and you don't even have anybody to go to in the community to help resolve disputes, help understand that, you know, we can take care of ourselves by I can point you in this direction. You can go to this place and get this. That's not, you know, it doesn't exist here, I think. And that's, and it's by design, you know, uh, let me tell you that uh, from, from my perspective. Um, and, you know, as opposed to other communities, 
on the continent of Africa that, that have that sense of community. They still have that commonality where they can work things out amongst themselves. And, you know, the way the communities are fractured here, you know, in the United States, specifically African-American communities, it, it tends to promote more of uh, dislike and continuation of self-hatred. So those are things that, that exist. And you asked the question, uh, Brother Al, of whether they can, it can come to that or not. It's going to take a lot of healing from a structural standpoint. You know, our systems are overloaded, you know, with mm -hmm. people who are traumatized. You know, our, our systems are stressed. You know, our public welfare systems are. You know, and uh, if people don't have the, the necessities of re respectful services that they, that they can get from our system that we're supposed to count on, then it's, it's going to be really hard for us to, to, to come together as a people who believe that we can help each other. We don't even know if we can help ourselves. Dr. Oliver? Yeah, uh, I appreciated what uh, both uh, Ricardo and Harvey had to say. I, it, as you know, we, we talked to Elizabeth, and uh, Elizabeth's in South Africa, and she encourages, not only in South Africa, but in other places, the notion of Ubuntu. And um, I think it's important, and I, I've seen uh, it work, uh, but depending on what the topic is, people have to be encouraged to be informed about what things they may be missing. Mm. And within different African communities um, in uh, the United States, they use community solutions where they get elders to come together and help to think about and think through different solutions to address the issues. But just like in the African-American community, let's say that you pull people together to try to be thoughtful about it. There's still different topics and sets of issues that one needs to be aware of in order for there to be a, a successful solution and resolution to a problem. Um, so if we're gonna talk about violence, it, you know, what you've heard me say over and over again, it's important to deal with uh, African-American men and the violence that we experience within the community and police violence. But we also have to be thoughtful about the violence that we do. Mm -hmm. We, we also have to be able to talk about violence against women. Yes. And so, uh, so there are different elements that have to be brought in the context of uh, addressing these sets of issues. If we're gonna talk about violence, for example, but the issue of depression, you know, the idea of, uh, of being able to recognize what the resources are to be able to combat that, you know, that, uh, you know, I've talked to you about uh, Bishop Young uh, and Reverend Young now in Memphis, and they have this every other year uh, conference that deals with Black suicide or suicide in the Black church. And they have different examples about how people survive it. They've had people who tried to commit suicide, who got over it, got help, and then they lecture. On it. Or if you uh, and talked about what helped them, or families that had to deal with the consequence of suicide, talk about it and talk about what helped them. Or if you have churches that dealt with suicide in the church due to domestic and you know um, combination suicide and homicide, then have conversations about that to figure out how to address it and develop resources within the community to be able to address those sets of things. So, you know, the Mbutu, I think, is an a important notion, but we also, I think, have to talk about what's missing in terms of being <laughs> with an idea without uh, discussing what other things we need to discuss, depending on what the issues are uh, related to that particular set of circumstances. Mr. Al, you ask if it's possible to teach it mm -hmm. uh, in this society, in this day and age. And I would say, yes, it is possible. Um, there are people practicing this you know, in other parts of the world. There are people practicing it 
to a, a smaller extent in our own, you know, in our own society. Uh, the challenge that we have is that uh, one, we have to unlearn a lot of uh, uh, ways of looking at the world that we hold dear, and in order to in order to relearn new ways of approaching things. But we saw people in South Africa do it. We saw people who had been under apartheid for generations, you know, revive their uh, their their you know ancient uh, principles and say, no, we're not going to do it the way Western society has taught us to blame and punish and, and seek retribution. We're going to fall back on uh, our, long -held, our you know, long held generational values and do it a different way. And the world was astounded that they were trying to do something like this, but they did it and it worked well. And other people, you know, still go there, you know, to try to learn, like, how did they do this and how did it work and can we do it you know, in our own society? Yes, we can, but we have to unlearn and undo a lot of what we already think we know how to do. And unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, most of the, the people who have the education and the credentials to do this have been so westernized in their education that it is difficult for them to let go of what they think they know. Let me respond, uh, uh, Dr. Linder, to what I what I hear you saying. Uh, I hear you uh, describing the um, the efficacy that South Africa discovered when the world expected a bloodbath to follow the end of apartheid. South Africa said, "Let's go back to a different way and figure out a way for all of us to be here as South Africans." The question becomes: uh, Is the fear of some kind of a bloodbath of retribution by the enslaved Americans, Africans in America, one of the driving forces for the structural uh, continued disembodiment of uh, the African person, personality. And is our challenge then as African people to elevate the idea of uh, our motive is not uh, what they fear. And the case in, in point is South Africa. What mm -hmm. do you think? I, we got about a minute, uh, Dr. Doctor, but this is a great, great well, conversation. Their fear is that we will treat them like they have taught us to treat them. And, you know, our challenge is to not do that. <laughs> gotcha. Listen, we're out of time. Gentlemen, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you all so very, very much. Dr. Harvey Linder, uh, Brother Ricardo Solomon, and uh, my colleague and partner, leader, Dr. Oliver Williams. Thank you so much. This has been a great edition of The Healing Circle. I'm Alan McFarland. Uh, we'll keep this conversation going. And uh, we think uh, it's an important one. We want you to be a part of it, too. So uh, be here with us next week. In fact, every day of the week for the conversation with Alan McFarland. We'll see you next time.